Okay, so uh, yeah, we, uh, we it. so to write on communication complexity and learning, or so <laughs> we know. Okay, yeah, so we are asking that <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, so I want to start with two uh, warm-up problems that we will probably the first hour or even more will be we will devote to solving them. So uh, the first problem is going to be convex set disjointness. Um, so we're going to have uh, Alice and Bob, right? So there's uh, Alice, and uh, let's put in blue uh, Bob, and each uh, get to see a sample. Um, each observe. sample, a finite sample, finite sample S A and S B in R D and they want to decide if the convex hulls uh, are disjoint or not. Uh, they want to decide if uh, convex S A slash convex S A convex S B is disjoint or not. Yeah, so in your set samples, it's the usual uh, communication complexity problem when it's the worst case in the Yes, sample. yes, yes. I'm gonna, yeah, there is no distribution in this. Uh, yes. Yeah, so maybe I'll say sets because it's not samples. Maybe I'll not use S also. So we'll use A and B, X and Y. Okay. Sets S B. <coughs> ah, and I need to tell you what they can do. So um, we're gonna allow them to uh, transmit points instead of bits. Okay, because uh, they have infinite uh, vectors, so obviously with bits, it might they might not be able to solve it. So Alice and Bob are allowed to uh, send points. Points in the sets. Ah, yeah, right. Points. Exactly. Point from uh, their sets. Okay, and obviously they can decide on a communication protocol in advance. So they decide, I'll send you this point, and then you send me this point, and, and so on. And they want to eventually, the protocol needs to output yes or not. But they are not allowed to send just no one bit. No. Okay, so. Um, so formally, if they can send points, they can somehow encode bits also, right? So I will, for example, I choose some point in my set. I send it at the beginning of the protocol, and then you know if I send it twice, it means bit one. If I send it three times, it's bit. Okay, so we're gonna, so we're just gonna add it. Okay, so we're gonna assume that they can also send bits. Okay, uh, without loss of generality, they can also send. bits and uh, how many bits okay how many samples they need to send? that's the main question how many points they need okay so just let me uh, maybe I'll add a picture so it will be clearer So this is Alice sets and, uh, and this is Bob sets. So we want uh, it to be disjoint or not disjoint, the samples. Again, it's all okay, so I'll do joint. 
right? Okay, so um, the set are disjoint, but if you look at the convex hulls of a Bob set and Alice set, then uh, these two sets intersect. <laughs> okay? Right, so it's, uh, maybe it's an issue. I need to show you that uh, there are non-trivial lower bounds, but uh, we'll start with showing that you can solve it. So yeah, so they can send real valued, but note that w what restricts them is the fact that they can only send points from their sets. That doesn't, like I can't just encode in the lower order bit my entire... Okay, yeah, uh, you, you need to show it, but uh, yeah, eventually you will see. You cannot do whatever you want. That, that restricts them in terms of the power. Okay, so this problem is uh, clear? Okay, so, um, so I want to start with a slightly uh, easier problem, which uh, can be solved uh, using some techniques in learning theory, which I will then uh, use to also solve this problem. But, thi but this problem is uh, ma a little bit easier, so maybe if you have uh, ideas from communication complexity to solve it, then Please do share them also. Okay? So I'm going to consider the following problem, which is a can be thought of set disjointness with a promise. Promise. So it's the same situation. Alice and Bob get to observe uh, points. Alice and uh, Bob observe sets uh, S A and S B and transmit the uh, points and can uh, send points. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, so the result should be dependent on the size of the sets. Should they send the whole set? Should they send half the set or logarithmic in the sense? Alice and Bob observe sets and can send points. So did you, did you say that oh. our goal is to send points because it is better than the size of the set? Oh, and you, you would hope for that, but no, you yeah, would need to. Yeah. and can send points from the sets. And they need to decide between two possibility. And they need to de uh, decide to distinguish, let's say. Between uh, to settings. So one, the sets are not disjoint, intersect. So now the sets are not, not the convex hull, but the actual sets have something in common. Or two, the convex hull uh, are disjoint. So how is it related to uh, communication complexity? So first, OK, so in this case, um, note that no none of the above happens, right? The set are disjoint, but the convex hull uh, do not intersect. So in this case, for example, Alice and Bob can return whatever they want. OK, so in that sense, this problem is a little bit easier, because I allow them uh, to not solve these cases. Um, okay, so um, just um, to relate it to, to communication complexity, so uh, let's suppose that uh, it's 
suppose that um, S A and S B come from a pre specified set. Sorry? Finite. Well, please say finite set. Of size, let's say, R. OK, so in this case, sending points can be turned into sending bits, right? Each point can be uh, encoded using log R bits. And then you can relate this to the set to the set disjointness problem. Okay, so you have the set disjointness problem, and you need to decide between two sets uh, whether they are disjoint or not. And uh, in this case, you would need at least. It is known that you need at least R bits. But now I add your promise. I tell you that if the sets are disjoint, then you can also se then they are easily separable. There is some simple separation function between them. Okay. And you can think of a generalization to, I don't know, like take something a little bit more complicated, polynomials or some uh, uh, s small circuits that separate the two sets. Okay, so but basically. You, say you need R bits. You need R bits. So for the disjoinness problem, yeah, you need a, uh, yeah. So, so in some sense, the question here is, does it help you that I tell you that the separation is easy, in some sense? But on the right-hand side, we're still sending real, real values? Yeah, yeah you real, you, in this case, you send real values. But I'm saying that if, if I also tell you from which set they come, then in some sense, sending real values, is you can, you can encode it with uh, some communication protocol. You can, but it's not real as useful. I mean, you yeah, yeah, it's right. In some, it, it just shows that, like, if I don't add you this promise, you cannot hope it to even solve it. Okay. So, um, so wha uh, what I want is I want to solve this problem with uh, kind of with an algorithm that is well known. Okay, this is not something new that we present, but it does use uh, some elementary ideas from uh, learning, boosting, and uh, epsilon net. So this will be a good way for us to describe the main techniques that we're going to use later. Okay, But uh, in, uh, like anyone has an idea of how to solve it using communication complexity? L in this setting, that I tell you the sets in advance, and you can send bits. Yeah, but I mean, in the setting in advance, it's not clear how items do come in, right? Because the set is a structure of R. Well, we can assume that this is a grid, right? Or uh, we can assume R is a grid, for example, in two dimension. A very refined grid. And in fact, you don't even need to. Or as a Boolean cube. R can be the Boolean cube, for example. I think one tempting argument for communication complexity uh, person is to say that. Right. So it's not a whole function. So one way to solve it is to say that uh, I can easily show you there is a non-deterministic proof that uh, the sets are not disjoint. Just show you the points, and also uh, to show you that the convex hull do not intersect, I can easily also show you. I just need to encode a linear separator. How would you do that? Uh, uh, a margin. Uh, n squared, uh, Support uh, vector machine uh, or something. The number of coefficients by line of, of set of R points is at most R squared. But, but the problem is this is not a whole function, right? It, uh, there are s it's not defined on all. So you cannot exactly solve it using this argument. OK. So we're going to use learning theory instead. So, um, okay, so, so a little bit about very few words about learning theory because 
what I don't want to do is I don't want to talk about distributions and generalization and stuff like that. So a lot of what I will say might not be complete or this is not the best introduction for our learning theory. Okay. Let me So learning, um, what do we have in learning? Usually we have uh, a domain, which is x. This is usually Euclidean space or the Boolean cube. Mostly in our case, it will be Euclidean space. And we have an hypothesis class. hypothesis class class which is often denoted by age so age is roughly basically it's a subset of functions from the domains to uh, minus one or one or to zero or one okay oh. so these are uh, fixed in a learning problem and um, a problem that you might want to solve or for let's simplest problem you're given a finite set of examples of labeled examples So it basically set S, X1, Y1, Xm, Ym, where each X and Y are from a product of a, a point from the domain and a label. Is it minus one or is it one? And the objective is to return, uh, say, a predictor. Objective, return f, which is a function from minus 1 to 1, with uh, such that Let's say that, okay, so let's, let's look at the realizable case. You want uh, to return a function that, a predictor that is completely correct. So it's one whenever uh, f x i equals y i, and you want this to be as close to epsilon as you can, as, uh, assuming some age in age, is consistent. Consistent means h of x i y i. Yeah. So, so if something is really good h is good. f can be just a proof table of uh, your samples, for example. Right, right. So that's what I said that I won't, don't want to get. So, um, OK. So let's get into details of in, in learning. So sometimes you would require f to come from the hypothesis class. That's called proper learning. So I give you a hypothesis class. I give you finite sample and I tell you find me some uh, function in the hypothesis class that is uh, correctly classifying the points. Okay, sometimes I will ask you to return me some function and then you're right, I can give you the truth table. So we add some other requirement. We want you to be efficient. We want uh, the number of samples that you need to observe will not be too large or something like that. Okay? Or we have a distribution and then we ask for generalization or something like that. Um, okay, so one thing we will need from learning is called the boosting algorithm. So boosting uh, so boosting algorithms as they turn uh, turn. OK, let's say reduce the problem of 
of learning. To weak learning. So what is weak learning? So a weak learner observes uh, let's say a weighted sample or a sample with a distribution over it. Okay. So a sample S with a distribution P over points and returns age such that so now I have some distribution over my sample points and I want that with respect to this distribution I will be uh, what is called slightly better than uh, random. There is no 1 over m, right? Because this is distributed. There is no what? 1 over m, you can determine the average in the beginning. You don't oh, yeah. Right. No, that will make well, it much easier. Uh, yeah. So gamma is fixed. So in other words, in learning, I ask for uh, to be arbitrarily close to 1. You need to be very, very accurate on all the examples. Weak learning, I just ask you, um, do better than random with, in, with some uh, fixed parameter. So just, so what boosting algorithms show is that if you know how to solve this, then you know how to solve this. Okay, you can turn basically, you can take these weak learners and turn them into a strong learner. In the world. Yeah, so uh, the yeah, so Shapiri uh, so non algorithmically Shapiri solved it in where do we like? I, the first in, in 1990, I think it, uh, I gave it no, in but in uh, in the work with Shapiri and Freund, he gave before. Efficient algorithm in a uh, okay. Beautiful. It's different than other boosting. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So 1990, the first algorithm, and then. Okay, so the algorithm I'm going to present is not that algorithm. It's going to be other boost. Um, so let me so so other boost is a boosting algorithm. It was uh, presented by Shapiri and Freund. Sorry. Alphabetical, but uh, somehow you, we always say Shapiro and Freud. No, it's okay, but in Hebrew it's uh, right. It's what? <laughs> in Hebrew it's wrong? Or <laughs> it, it, wait, <laughs> Shapiro and Freud is okay or not? Freud Freund Shapiro. So why am I? But I okay. It's like VC is actually also alphabetically. You know, usually when you talk in Hebrew, you should say things behind the back of those who don't understand Hebrew. <laughs> if you're saying you say it. <laughs> Shapiri, six, 96. Okay. Um, okay, so this is how the algorithm works. So we start with. Um, we start with a. Uh, uh, Uniform distribution of our sample. So we start with P1, which 
is proportional to one. Okay, so uniform distribution over the sample. Why? Oh, because the, the okay. So maybe I'll write, I'll change the notation here to p p of i. Okay. Okay. So we start with a uniform distribution, and now we do iterations. Okay, we ask uh, ask a weak learner such that okay, if I draw points from that distribution from the sample, okay, the distribution is over the sample points, right? Then. Uh, Okay, write it like this. So, okay, this is what we basically are guaranteed to have, right? We say that for every distribution, I can ask for some random guesser. So I have a distribution, and I ask for a random guess, and then we set uh, LTI will be uh, basically a one wherever I'm right, and zero wherever I'm wrong, so it's a vector. And we're going to change the distribution over the sample to be, um, so pt plus 1 is going to be proportional to pt times e minus epsilon lt. OK, so this is a pointwise uh, multiplication. So in other words, I have the sample. Maybe I'll, I'll draw what I do. So I have a sample. OK, so I start with the uniform distribution. And then I ask uh, for a weak learner. So let's say the, the learners are uh, linear classifiers. So roughly a line that goes like this, it's not completely correct. It's wrong with some examples, but it is better than random. Okay? It guesses correctly some points. And this is uh, the HT that I get. And now I look at the sample and say, OK, on the points that I'm correct, let's put a distribution that is less critical. Weight. Less weight, yeah. So, so I put less weights. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, the, okay, the probability of the point yeah. with respect to the new distribution is going to be less. And I get, give more emphasis to points that I was wrong. So basically, the next random guesser I'm asking will have to be uh, more correct where the other uh, hypothesis was wrong. So in that sense, I always, like the new, distribu the new distribution ask for the shows the hard examples. Those examples that so far I'm still misclassifying. And and what we want to show is that eventually uh, using this ah and what do I <laughs> right. so what do I output okay so eventually I will output the majority so what what I want to show is that so output let's call it f which is the majority of all the hypotheses that I saw so far. Capital T? Yeah. Right, okay. Didn't I didn't define. So now I'm going to give the guarantees. What, what? I'm going to give the guarantees, and then we're going to choose T appropriately. Okay, so the, the core of the proof, which I'm not going to prove, is relies on the following uh, result. So this is the hard part I'm not showing. And then I'm going to show how it derives uh, that uh, this algorithm works. So um, what you, you can show, you can show uh, that 
for every iteration t, t equal one to t. If we look at p t i, t i minus the worst coordinate l t i, then this is always smaller than epsilon t plus log m over epsilon. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So, LTI, so at each point, each iteration, I define a vector which is one when you are correct on that example, and zero when you are wrong. Oh, so LT of i is one of HT of x i equals y i. Yeah. Okay. So this is a, you can think of this point as a point where you are mostly wrong on. Okay, and, and indeed, if we... Maybe you want to, to find stuff in the, in the... Right. Okay. And then if... The number of mistakes you made. Yeah. So now remember that the, the property of the algorithm is that... Okay, so here it's also... This is... We go over all examples, right? So remember that the, the guarantee we have is that this is always slightly better than random. So this is always half plus gamma. Okay, right? Um, no, PT of i is a probability vector. Yeah. PT of i is a probability of vector, and you chose PTI, okay. so you, you chose the hypothesis, so this is will half plus gamma. That was a guarantee from the weak learning. Yeah. So if you change uh, sides, you can show base. We get that minimum over all possible points one H T X I equal Y I. So this is larger than. So this is T half of gamma. Let me write it again. <laughs> okay, I was afraid you were uh, mad at me or something. <laughs> okay. I was just making sure no one is mad at me. Right? So Okay, so this is uh, this expression. So this is larger than t half plus gamma. And here, if I choose epsilon to minimize this, so I choose it uh, to be square root log m divided by square root t, I would get that this is uh, twice square root t log m. Okay, by choice, epsilon equals uh, um, square t divided by log. Okay, so this is how I choose my epsilon. Okay, so now let's divide both sides by, by t. So now you can see that this is, when t grows, this is going to vanish because it's going to vanish. And what this equation says is that um, if you look at the worst point, if you look at how many classifiers were correct on it, it is at least half plus gamma. Okay, so eventually if t is large enough for this to vanish, we would get that the majority of the hypothesis that this algorithm output are correct on every example. Okay, so I'll just say how we need to choose. So if you choose t to be roughly log m, over gamma square, then you would get that the majority is correct on every point. Okay, so this is how many points, this is how many iterations you need. This does this does better than what you wrote. What did I?
Right, right, right. Yeah, you're right. I got that one, epsilon equals zero. Because it's a finite sample. Yeah. yeah maybe it's for people who didn't see the half part of this uh, thing, it's a good exercise and it's, uh, it takes about two or three lines of algebra. It's very simple and it's pretty short. Anyway. OK, so, um, so this is one part of the proof. Uh, that we're going to need. Another property we're going to use is what is called epsilon nets for a hypothesis class. So, so I can erase this, right? Or, uh, okay. So I'm just going to state uh, the main result. Epsilon nets for VC classes so um, okay so uh, recall what is the VC dimension so recall a hypothesis class has a VC dimension D is the largest a shattered set is of size D. Size D, so what is a shattered set? A shattered, a set is shattered. A set is shattered. A set, uh, let's give it x prime is shattered if uh, for every uh, function from uh, the set to minus 1, 1, x prime, there is h in h such that when I look at h restricted to the set, I get f. So basically, if I look at the set, all possible dichotomies of the set are possible by the hypothesis class. So the VC dimension of the class is the largest such uh, such that, okay? So just I'd say for linear, uh, for linear separators, yeah, okay, um, how do I, so the class, the class of linear separators of half spaces, let's say. Half spaces has VC <coughs> in RD. Okay. Okay, so it's related to our problem because if you look at all possible uh, D plus one, hmm? D plus one, D plus one. Four. Okay. And the main uh, so the main fact that um, is kind of fundamental in learning is that we can always have an epsilon net so th this is Vapnik and Chervonetsky, right the epsilon net fact and if age is uh, as we see smaller than D uh, for every 
sample. So uh, this showed something stronger, but I'll just use this. For every sample S, one, one. Uh, and distribution P over S. Uh, that is consistent. Okay, for every sample, let's see, if S is consistent, consistent with age, meaning there is some uh, hypothesis here which uh, defines these labelings, uh, there is a subsample of size so S prime is of size order of D over epsilon such that uh, if age is consistent Is S prime, then then the number of mistakes it makes on this full sample is at most epsilon. Okay. Oh, wi with respect to the distribution, right? So. So in other words, if I want to choose the hypothesis that it's correct on the whole sample, I don't need to observe the whole sample. I can basically, oh, oh and I say that uh, a random set will suffice. Okay, choose a, a set according to PI, it will probably be okay. I, I mean, using here existence, but any sample almost is there. In other words, if you want to choose the hypothesis that it's correct on a whole sample, and you get to observe the whole sample, not in the case of Alice and Bob, you get to observe the whole sample, just draw a random sample, find the hypothesis that is correct on that sample, it will probably be correct on the whole sample, up to epsilon error. Okay? So um, these are the two uh, things that I'm going to use, epsilon nets and uh, boosting. Okay? So remember what problem we want to solve. Alice and Bob gets two sets, and they want to decide between two possibilities. The sets intersect or uh, the, set, the convex halar disjoint. So uh, Rigman, uh, convex halar disjoint basically means that there is a half space that gives one on Alice's points and gives minus one on Bob's point. OK? So how are we going to solve it? I just want to comment that uh, I would call it the theorem and not the it's, it's much weaker than the actual yeah, theorem, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, so I. Okay. Oh, Alice and Bob only get the set points from the set, not from the convex holes of the set. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you can always uh, have a support. That, uh, you, know, you, you can, without loss of generality, separate the hyperplane, might, might as well rest on the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, was, I thought we were sending real numbers, and I was really good. Right, right. No, yeah. no, no, no. The main. No. Right, so that would be very easy. If I can just send real numbers and I could yeah, encode yeah. everything. Okay. Um, I'm going to need this equation probably later. We won't, we won't need the actual algorithm. Okay, so Alice will uh, Alice uh, will label labels her set by ones, 
Okay, so basically we're going to think of Alice's uh, set as let's a one one. We're going to think of it as a labeled set, and she's going to assume that everything is labeled one. And Bob is going to do similarly, but he's going to label everything as minus one. B1, yeah. Well, the answer is no. Yes, the set of this joint. It's yeah, minus one. And now what they're going to do is they each is going to run boosting individually on their own sets. The only thing that they will agree on is a hypothesis in each one. Okay. And how are they going to do that? They are going to communicate points and going to choose uh, a hypothesis using the epsilon net. Okay, so um, each uh, party runs boosting. On their own sample. At iteration t, let's say that um, Bob's distribution, Alice's distribution, oh no, Alice's distribution is uh, PTA, and Bob's distri uh, distribution is PTB. So now they want to uh, decide together on a hypothesis that is both a weak learner with respect to this uh, distribution and a weak learner with respect to this distribution. So each chooses, let's say, uh, 1 over 4 net with respect to their own sample, their sample. So this is of size O of D, right? There are D points that are uh, 1 over 4 net with respect to their own distribution. Uh, they send it. They send, so let's call this A, T, and B, T. So A, T is in uh, 1 over 4 net with respect to her distribution, uh, Alice's distribution, and B, T is in 1 over 4 dis net with respect to Bob's distribution. And uh, now Alice and Bob choose choose H T that is consistent with. Both samples, okay. Okay, so if they can choose it, if they can. Say how they start, right? I mean, no. Well, that's the first. So no, they run boosting. So in boosting. Uh, oh, but in boosting, uh, you start with a uniform distribution. Yeah, you start with a uniform distribution, but you need. Uh, oh, this is what they are using as the. Yeah, they use this HT as the. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That is okay. So because it's consistent both with AT and with BT, it is one over F, uh, the the hypothesis will be both on be will make at most three quarters mistakes on Alice's set and three quarters mistake on Bob's set. No, no, no. So each got their own set, and now each uh, party runs a boosting algorithm. They. So you start the boosting algorithm. You take the sample and you start with uniform okay, distribution. The Ta boosting. No, it's not. I erased it. <laughs> so you start with a uniform distribution, okay. and then at each iteration, you get a, a weak hypothesis, okay. and you so update. The weak hypothesis would only do well with respect to my own sample. Why would it be consistent with AT, Union, BT? So that that is a, okay. So once they transmitted AT and BT. 
they, they, to be consistent with AT and BT is no problem because you see, okay, both of them see AT and BT. That's the only thing that both of them see. So they choose something that is consistent both with AT and BT, and because it's an epsilon net, uh, HT is consistent with for a. Let's let's. Okay, because it's because it's an epsilon net, you have this guarantee. So HT will be uh, a weak learner for uh, Alice, and the same guarantee you have for both. Okay, so basically they can both run the boosting algorithm. So they only need to agree uh, a priori how they choose HT, but for ev we, we come up with a pre-specified rule that says for these two sets, choose this hypothesis and so on. So they choose the same hypothesis, and we have the guarantee that um, okay, if the algorithm succeeds, if the protocol continues for t equal log m. So it's a uh, 64, I don't know, 64 rounds. Then majority of H1 to HT is consistent. So I, yeah, so let's write it as order of. So I said each of them gets the same sample. Okay. Order of log m divided by 64. So they end up sending log m times d, log m times d. Oh, yeah. Point. Yeah, so overall they send at each iteration d points, and they had log m iterations, so they sent the log m uh, number of uh, points. And of course, okay, so what do we have? So if we run this algorithm, and uh, eventually they are consistent. And obviously, the two sets are not uh, do not intersect because you cannot be consistent with every point if there is one point that is both one and minus one. On the other hand, uh, if the set are uh, are separable, it means that at each iteration there is a good hypothesis. So they can always choose a good hypothesis if the sets are separable. So there is no reason that this algorithm will will stop running. So they can run it for this many rounds. And uh, if, if it runs for this many rounds, they know that the sets are separable. And if they, the sets intersect, then they cannot run it for this many rounds. Because so this way, they can decide if the sets are disjoint or not. Sorry, if this, like the promise problem. OK. I know that we didn't use anything that has to do with uh, hyperplanes other than the VC dimension. OK, so overall, you can ask this question for any hypothesis class. You want to decide between set disjointness, given the promise that if the set are disjoint, then uh, the separator is a polynomial, decision tree, or anything like that. You didn't need that they are from some big grid R or something. No, yeah, he doesn't. no if I want to now reduce this to communication complexity, then because my model allows me to some points. Yeah. They, okay, they don't agree on the separator. No, no, you, you agree, you can say, you both of them see AT and BT and BT. Let's see if the line is maximum bounding. Okay. You, you, only, you only need to look at the grid. You only need to co consider a grid if you want to compare it to results in, in bit complexity, mm -hmm. right? Because then you need to somehow, how would you compare the two results? Um, so if you agree on a grid, then without the promise, you would need to still send R bits. And and uh, using this algorithm, you can say log r bits. Right? So the problem is easier. OK, so that's the, the set disjointed with promise. Uh, now we want to solve this problem. OK, so where does it fail to solve this problem? So, OK, so let's run this algorithm. Um, what do we know? If we succeed, if the sets are separable, then this algorithm will succeed. We'll get a majority, and the majority is correct on all points. Uh, but do we have a promise that this algorithm will fail if the convex hull are disjoint? For set 
this joiners, we had a promise because you cannot be consistent with a sample where the, in the sample you see both a negative and a positive point. But now you have something nickel. You only assume that there is no linear separator. You can still have a majority of separators that is correct. Okay? So that algorithm will fail uh, in its current form to solve this problem. Okay, so if, the it was the, if the final hypothesis, if it was proper, then you would have no problem. I, yeah, if this algorithm would output something proper, then, uh, yeah, you want an algorithm that instead of uh, outputting a majority, it will output, uh, but we're not going to do that yet. We're going to still output a majority, and still we're going to solve this. Okay? So, um, okay, so how are we going to change this algorithm so it will work? So, uh, perhaps... Um, one way uh, to see that is, okay, so let's think of boosting as a, let's interpret boosting as a game and see how we can, so what can I, okay, so I can erase this, right? Okay, so given a sample S, okay, so labeled examples, consider again where uh, player one. chooses a distribution over uh, over hypothesis the age uh, player two chooses a point in the sample and suffers um, so minimum so it chose obviously the one that would minimize his loss and now we have look at the distribution So he wants to minimize them, right, he wants to make, he wants to choose a point that the hypothesis are going to be wrong on. Okay, so player one chooses a hypothesis, which is a distribution of all the, all the hypotheses. So player two, and player one, he wants to choose a point where uh, this distribution is most inaccurate. Okay? So there are two things about this game. So first of all, if the sample is consistent, then obviously, uh, the player that chooses the distribution over hypothesis is going to always achieve one, right? Because you can always do that. Um, so one player has new strategies and the other one has two strategies? Always the second one can, right? So I'm, on, I'm assuming well, the second player. It's, it's, it's in this order. Yeah, I, exactly. So they can all both do but There are some games. Okay. okay, so first of all, it's if the sample is consistent, the value of the game is one in a very trivial way. And second, we can think, second observation, is you can think of boosting in some algorithmic way to achieve a value half, right? What does boosting do? In the end, it will output a majority, which can be thought of as a uniform distribution of a set of hypotheses. And uh, this distribution will achieve on each point half, okay? So, in order to solve the solver convex side disjointness, I want to show. The majority is half. No, the, the is correct on. So, so the majority is correct, but if you draw a distribution, it will get half. Okay. So, I want to show two things. First of all, actually, boosting is much stronger. You can just run it for a few more rounds, and you can be not just half, you can be as close as you want to one. 
if the samples are uh, this uh, uh, the sample is realizable. Yeah, yeah. And the second thing is I want to show is that what happens if the sample is not realizable? So if I can show that if the sample is not realizable, this game now is non-trivial in the sense that you can you cannot be even close to one. That there is some uh, distinct value from one that you can achieve. Then uh, now I can basically use the same algorithm to decide if the set are disjoint or not, in the sense that. If the convex hull of this joint. So if given a finite sample, I have an algorithm that can be arbitrarily close to one if the samples are realizable. On the other hand, I need to show it. But if I'll show that there is a guarantee that says if the samples are not realizable, then you cannot get a value close to one, then I can basically just run the algorithm, try to beat this value. And if I can beat this value, it means that the set are this joint, right? Yeah, that th I will need to show that. For any S that is not realizable, the value of this gain is strictly smaller than 1. OK, so um, maybe first I'll show that. OK, so how first I want to show is that I can basically achieve a value as close as I want to 1. OK? So now I'll use return to this equation. If I wrote it somewhere. Okay. OK, so the idea is basically, instead of just a weak learner, I'm going to choose something that is a, a weak, strong learner, something that is half minus 1 over k. So now, if you look at this equation, this is as close as I want to 1. And again, this is going to basically vanish for large enough t. So overall, if, if my learners are strong enough, then yeah, if you run boosting long enough, it will be as close as you want to any value that you want. OK, so. Uh, if in boosting we choose gamma uh, weak learners with, let's say, gamma equals half minus 1 over k. OK, so before we needed to uh, have 1 over 4 weak epsilon net. Now we need an epsilon net that is correct on this. So we, k is, k is going to be d. Um, so k is going to be this value that I'm going to show you later that I can beat. So n for now, let's take k to be k as. Is the 1 over epsilon in the epsilon of the Watt-Mister mm -hmm. Yeah, it will be the same. as. So uh, as before, they can agree on 1 as before. They can agree on a one over k on on a gamma weak level by sharing a uh, one over k net. Okay. So they transmit all k d points now. So before I just wanted one over four. Now I'm saying no. I want I want this, the learners to be much stronger. I want them to be almost correct on all points for some k, which I still haven't specified. But I'm going to do that by simply transmitting more points. Is that clear? Or? So they transmit this many points. And again, so uh, you can see that this will vanish. So I'll give you how much after after t equals o k square log m 
rounds. Because you can make this better, but uh, then if we look at the majority now, we just plug this into this equation and we get that uh, the number of hypotheses that are correct on each point is loud is almost one of one k. Okay. So just on boosting with strong enough learners, you can be as given that the sample is realizable, you can be as close to the value of the game as you want. It's for every R you want this is for. Yeah, so this is the minimum I. So given a finite sample, I can play this game and get this value. Oh, and just to be sure, so both Alice and Bob can verify this, right? So they run the algorithm, and eventually they can say, on my set, a supermajority is correct. On my set, supermajority is correct. Everything is correct. OK. So the only thing I need to show you is that there is some lower bound. So there is, if the sample is not realizable, then there is some value k, so that they cannot even try to achieve. The value of the game is bounded. OK, so I'll write it here. Yep. Claim. Let S. I'm going to use, but it's going to be true only for hyperplanes. This point. Be a sample that is not realizable not realizable means that you cannot uh, distinguish so there is no hyperplane that divides that gives plus one to one side and minus so one to yeah. yeah so in other words the convex how did those stuff yeah uh, then there exists a sample a spine of size two d plus one uh, that is not realizable. Subsum, yeah. That is not realizable. Uh, in particular, if I choose a uh, distribution if x, y are uniform over d, that's if I choose a distribution over the examples, uh, D uniform over D over S prime, <coughs> then um, the best hypothesis for every hypothesis is smaller than 1. So if you have a sample of size 2d plus 1 that is not realizable, then uh, if you just randomly pick a point from this sample, no, no hypothesis can correctly label all of them. So it has to be wrong or at least one. So the best hypothesis. OK, so now basically I'm using duality. So this is the same as, right? So we instead of I'm changing the order of the players, and this is the same. Okay, so now again I run the boosting algorithm. At each iteration, <coughs> I will send uh, KD points, which is a epsilon net. We both agree on a hypothesis that it's uh, consistent of the sample. We have the following guarantee. If the sample is realizable, then after k square log m rounds, we will have a super majority that correct, given k. And now I give you a value for k to d plus 1 
so that if the sample is not realizable, then this is not possible. You cannot achieve such a, a good uh, result. Okay, so uh, the proof is basically Kara Theodori. So I'll do it by a uh, drawing. Oh, so I have the drawing. I don't have Wikipedia here, I don't know. <laughs> it's Kara Theodori. That claim is no. That claim is not right. Rather, so the drawing implies both heavy and carotid. You have two. You, you have two convex sets which in, uh, intersect in in R D. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you can uh, you can pick D plus one point from each of them so that the convex R D intersects. That is that is isn't the statement of Radon as a uh, as is or is it like? No, uh, Radon says that if you have more than D plus one point, then you can partition them to yeah, different bases. Yeah, uh, it's for, all right, so it's, uh, yeah. okay, so just the proof, <laughs> exactly, so <laughs> uh, every point uh, in, a, in a convex hull can be represented using d plus one points, so if the sets are uh, intersect, so there is one point here that intersect both sets, it can be represented using uh, three points from here, right, and it can also be represented using three points from here, so overall, it can be represented. It th these two sets must be inseparable, right? Because the, the convex hull of those already intersect. Okay, so we use duality, but we also use a certain property uh, of uh, hyperplanes, half spaces. That actually the there is this property. Okay. Yeah. So that's basically what we're going to do now. Okay. We're going to uh, abstract this. But I, I think uh, that first maybe I'll describe the model. Or okay, so this was uh, this was the warm up. Let's uh, describe uh, the actual model. Okay, so um, in so first we have a low bound of the uh, VC dimension for both problem, both the promise problem and the decision problem. You need at least D dimension. That's basically the compression scheme, and we also have a low bound of uh, that, that's the more uh, intriguing low bound of log m. So you need log m number. Of okay. Ah, so maybe what what did we we showed here uh, D k, sorry D fourth log m right. That's what we showed. The paper just uh, technically improves this to D3 log M. Um, but the best, this is, but the best lower bound we have for D plus log M. So okay? Would yeah, yeah. well D equals one, you just need two points, right? Would well, one, you just have two intervals, you want to isolate the endpoints on the line, you get endpoints on the line, yeah. you need to know if they're... The log m, you mean, yeah. So, only in the plane. Only in the plane. So, it's not true, it's not correct. So, for D, correct? No, there is, a, you, I, there is a hypothesis class where you need log m number of samples, okay? Not for a general... Yeah, it just you means didn't that you... You didn't define the general problem. Yeah. We just discussed how to define the Okay, for D equals larger than two, you would need at least log M. Okay, so this is actually a, a corollary of uh, existing results. This is, uh, we work pretty hard to achieve. Yeah, I'm missing something extremely basic. I thought we got D log M, and now you're saying you should use D log M. No, so we needed, uh, at each iteration, they needed to send D square log M. K, the K, the value, the oh, distinction, they needed to send. This is for the problem that was on the left hand side. Yeah. So they needed d square log m, and uh, at each round they needed d square, so we got d fourth. But you can actually do the d cube. Okay. Okay. So um, the model is more about uh, 
learning. So, so far we solved actually decision problem. What we are actually interested in solving learning problems, uh, we consider a fixed domain. X and the hypothesis class H. Uh, Alice receives samples. So, so far, I basically assume that each one sees just a homogenic sample, right? Pluses or minus. This is not really, we didn't actually use this assumption anywhere. We could have seen pluses and minuses each. Okay, so, SA is going to see a sample. It's 1A, let's see it, A1A. 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 AM. YM. And similarly, Bob. Bob sees SB. And what do we, co we consider a joint sample? S, which is SA and SB. And the loss function. Okay, so this is a problem that uh, Alice and Bob, this is, called, this is a search problem that Alice and Bob. Uh, what is their goal? Yeah, so their goal, so now we're going to define the, the realizable, the improper, the agnostic, and all those settings. But overall, their goal is to minimize our loss. So they want to communicate as few points as possible and somehow minimize uh, their loss. They're going to choose an age. They want to, okay, they want to choose an age. And now we can, uh, so what's standard in learning is that you have the setting where they want to choose age from the class H. That would be called proper learning. They want to choose age, uh, not, okay, F, not necessarily from H. That would be called improper learning. And then you have also this division to agnostic and, and uh, realizable. So in the realizable says, okay, so let's just restrict ourselves to realizable case. So we're going to assume that there is some age in the class that is perfect, and they want to find properly or improperly. This model sort of captures uh, distributed learning. The Th this, uh, this is what we want to hope, yeah. We want to... Like like multiple... Yeah. Just two. This is just two just parts. This is two. Yeah. yeah. But overall, the hope is to somehow understand. So now there is a very big... Oh, and uh, the uh, there is a... Well, you, a lower bound is a lower bound, right? It will always. Two parties is the easiest case, right? Just partition the k parties to two parties. There is no, uh, yeah, it's not the input is not on your forehead. It's a k party. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a k party. If you have a two party lower bound, you have a. Yeah. So okay, so let's look at the realizable case and. Right, so you, you can, everything, if it's easier to think about, just think that Alice got the ones and Bob got the minus it's one. one yes, it's equivalent. You can think of uh, x, y as a, as a as a example. Yes. And if it's in the, if it's consistent, then it's one, and if not. I was thinking, we're not even at the beginning, the whole sample may confuse you. It's a worst case thing. It's not like there's a distribution and I guess Alice gets the input from one side, Alice gets they don't no, I understand, but in the original problem, Alice got the ones and Bob yeah. got the minus ones, right? Yeah. So if you're proving a lower bound for a more general case, it's clear. Okay, so um, I need, you want me to write the proper improper settings, or is it clear? 
Okay. So uh, before, okay, maybe I want to uh, relate this model. So one thing that is interesting about this model is distributed learning. There is a large motivation today to understand, especially algorithms like stochastic gradient descent. You want to understand if they are very sequential, and people want to understand if there is a way to distribute them. So hope we hope maybe this algo this model can help in uh, understanding better what can you expect to do in a distributed setting. Uh, another motivation is uh, what is known in as compression schemes. schemes. So this is a little stone. Warm up. Eighty-six. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're making me nervous. Um, okay. So, if you, it's kind of usually complicated to explain what is a compression scheme, there is a compression function and reconstruction, but this model actually makes it very easy. So think of the following setting: uh, Alice gets all the point, and Bob does not get all the point and doesn't get any points, and they want to uh, improperly learn the class. Okay, so Alice wants to send uh, examples to Bob so that he will have a good classifier over her old sample. So you're restricting Alice, Alice can't send the hypothesis she has to send. I, uh, she can never send the hypothesis, right? The, the, we, there's no restriction. It's the same model, only now you assume that Alice got to see all the points. It's a one-sided uh, case. So this model, in some sense, generalizes uh, this certain of compression schemes. And OK, so what we showed is already a D log M algorithm. Okay, so we have a O D log M. Right, so just use the boosting, the distributed boosting algorithm. Uh, you would get, eventually, the majority is correct. Uh, it's a two-sided algorithm, so obviously it's uh, one-sided. And for a long time, this was the best known uh, bound for compression scheme. And the main question was, is, and still is, whether uh, either a compression scheme of size Order of D. Right. So th that was so for a long time. Not only we did not know that there is a order D, there was actually no bound. The, the best known algorithm, it's the same algorithm as we showed. Okay, um, was always dependent on the size of the sample. And uh, Moran and uh, Yudayov showed in. Uh, Yeah, I don't know this guy. What? <laughs> you dive did all the Amir did all the work and Shai just interfered and <laughs> didn't interfere too much. So uh, it <laughs> now he's alive, or right. um, show that uh, order of two D, two to the D. Okay. Not even two to the D times two to the D, but nevertheless. Right. It, it's not even this. <laughs> they showed. If they were really sophisticated, they could show two to the D, but all they could show was D to the two to the D. Okay? Okay, so um but I think what is interesting is like I said, we have a low bound of log M. And sometimes it shows that um if you look at two sided compression schemes, then this was actually tight. This is the best you could achieve. And this algorithm inherently cannot be turned into a, to a two-sided communication, distributed learning algorithm. Yes, but for half length, even for half length, for the yeah. a very simple compression scheme size 3, or the rest of it cannot distribute it to a better than two scheme block. OK. Um, and this is still open. But Okay, so now uh, I want to define for this uh, question that, uh, so these are search problems. You want to compute a hypothesis. 
what we showed so far are decision problems, right? You wanted just to decide uh, between two cases. So let me define the, the related decision problem that so far what we've done is basically looked at the special case of hyperplanes. So related decision problems so uh, the decision problem decide if a sample is realizable so now we're talking about general hypothesis class, okay? And the uh, promise problem, I call it uh, distinguish. between one. And the class is realizable. The sample, sorry. The sample is realizable. And two, there is inconsistency, i.e., there for some x, x one, x minus one is in the joint sample. Okay. So what we did in the warm-up is basically solved uh, both. We consider both the decision problem. And the promise problem uh, for the case of the, the hypothesis class is a hyperplane. OK, we, we, div we, yeah, we said that they only see one label, but there was no, n everything we did was kind of general. And also, we kind of, I think, uh, saw that the promise problem is basically the same as uh, solving the improper learning. OK, so when they solve the promise problem, they used the boosting algorithm, which eventually outputted a majority, which was correct on all the examples. OK? Uh, on the other hand, in the decision problem, things are a little bit less clear, right? We so we, here also, we, we saw only VC dimension. That's all we needed. So given finite VC dimension, we can solve the promise problem. And it's OK. In the decision problem, we needed to use some properties. Um, we needed to, to distinguish between the values of the game. And we still haven't seen it. And like, can, if we can solve it, can we actually learn? But the, I think that we agree that the flavor it, it is related to the problem. Okay, so I think what but are. We still have a question, right? This was a special case. Uh, yeah, but I'm saying what, what is the relation between decision problem and uh, proper learning? Okay, so we still even haven't seen why solving the decision problem means solving the proper learning. The way we prove law about the third problem is by considering a, a corresponding decision problem. And the first problem in this law, the decision problem, is going to solve the proper learning, and the other one is going to solve the proper learning. Okay, so. Um, OK, so perhaps I'll just uh, summarize for the, promise prob for, the, for the improper learning, and then we can talk about proper learning. Um, OK, so we showed. Um, so theorem, let H be a class uh, 
with finite DC dimension. D, then age is learnable. With sample complexity. D O D log M. Uh, so okay, so this is basically the distributed. I, I don't think I mentioned, by the way, that the distributed algorithm that we considered was uh, due to Balkan, uh, Blam, uh, Fine, Mansour. So the, they basically devise a protocol for distributed learning uh, using boosting. In, in not. The one for uh, the original one, not for the decision problem, but for the promise problem, just to for use for how to perform boosting using distributed learning. Can you boosting in between the model or k-parties and they basically solve the promise problem? Yeah, and there's not the, not that language, but it's yeah. basically the solution is from there. Um, what we show in this paper is a lower bound, uh, so let h be a class of half spaces in Rd to be larger than 2. And uh, then any protocol that improperly learns need oh of the slog. Yeah. Okay. And the idea to solve it is basically to show a low bound on the promise problem. So obviously if you can learn the problem improperly, you can solve the promise problem. So what we show is an example where Using pointer jumping in the plane, the number of rounds they need to decide if there is a joint point or not, they would need to uh, transmit at least log m. Also, say that the, the main difficulty in this lower bound is that any point may contain as, as many bits as possible. So you cannot just use naively the communication that the lower bound to the number of bits. And the trick is to use a round uh, communication protocol. Round simultaneously with number of rounds. Okay. So now uh, I want to focus on the decision problem. Um, okay, so, so, so we show that for hyperplane you can solve the decision problem uh, using uh, log m number of bits. By the way, if for agnostic learning, you can replace m with epsilon. You want to be epsilon accurate, then log m is one log one over epsilon, and you need one over epsilon. So the first question is: Okay, so is it true for any class that you can learn it using uh, log m? So uh, I'll just say that no, it's not true. Uh, there exist. Class age with VC dimension such that uh, we need omega n examples to learn. M, M, M. <laughs> okay. To learn. 
Okay, so instead of showing, uh, I'll show something a little uh, simpler. I'll show that for every M, I'll construct a hypothesis class for which you need at least M examples. And then the way is just to concatenate this hypothesis class. Okay, it's something a little bit quicker. But um, so the idea is just to choose uh, the class is going to be uh, singletons. over M. So this is a class with this is such that we to learn, to learn properly. Right. Yeah. Um, Okay, so why can't they solve? So the problem with uh, singletons is that, oh, and the sample I'm going to show, we will show uh, to each party uh, a sample. Labeled negative. Yeah. Sorry? You label one point with plus one and all the other. Ah, yeah. Minus one. one point is. Uh, the yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show for each uh, yeah. party a sample that is completely negative. All the points are negative. So instead of properly learn, let's say that they just want to solve the decision problem, which is easier. Then uh, when is this joint sample uh, realizable? Only if they didn't see everything, right? Because uh, if they saw everything, you cannot label everything as negative. But if they did not see everything, then there is some hypothesis that is correct. Just choose a point out of the sample. So uh, the sample is realizable. Only if um, S A cap S B is not everything. Okay. Um, but now, if they can solve this, then basically they solve a set disjointness problem, right? They look at the complement, and they just need to decide if the complement are disjoint or not. So M is fixed, so they're going to use log M bits. So they can basically turn a protocol that solves this to a protocol with a factor log M. Oh, so maybe I need to be careful here and add a tilde. OK, so it's up to logarithmic factor, correct? But overall, if they can't solve it, they can solve the set disjointness problem. So this problem uh, cannot be solved. But what is the main difference between uh, this hypothesis class and uh, uh, hyperplanes, so note that not only they could not uh, solve the decision problem, they could not even uh, have uh, some short proof that the sample are not disjoint. Okay? And uh, for uh, hyperplanes, the, the sample are disjoint, right? Um, or that the sample are, so that the sample is everything, equals everything. So roughly what we're going to show is uh, this property. That when, so, so for the decision problem and for proper learning, what we're going to show is that when they can decide these two things, they can actually, not, there is a non deterministic way for them to prove that the sample is not uh, realizable. What we did with Kara Theodori, then they can solve the problem, then they can learn. And also, we're going to show, give a combinatorial uh, measure that says, what is the property that the hypothesis class needs to have in order for this? So we're going to define a notion that is called CoVC dimension. And whenever the CoVC dimension is uh, K, then uh, they can do it. So here, NP is like co NP equals P. Yeah, so we're going to have a P equal NP, co NP, as in communication complexity. OK, so I want to define these classes. And then I'll define the notion of CoVC dimension. And I'll state basically the decision problem. I think this 
this would be the generalization of the simplex, right? This d plus one for the yeah, yeah, exactly. So the the Karato Dori showed us that the co and p uh, problem is two to the d plus one. Exactly. Okay, so let's define P and P and the coin P. Uh, a, a hypothesis class is in P if there exists Uh, protocol. So everything is for the decision problem, okay? A protocol with uh, sample complexity. Okay, so sample complexity means the number of uh, samples they need to send uh, of polylog m and a class is in a hypothesis class is in np If for every realizable sample S, there is a sub sample S prime. of size uh, O of polylog M and the uh, protocol function because it's an undeterministic protocol that receives S prime prime and returns realizable, but for every non-realizable, sample S outputs non-realizable. Okay, so this is very similar to NPNP. Okay, it's clear. Or, uh, okay, and similarly, we can define the co NP for non realizable. So we want that there is for every non realizable sample, I can show you a subsample to Alice and Bob, and both of them agree this sample is not realizable. But on the other hand, they will not be deceived for. Uh, and. Okay. And now. I'll uh, give generalization of Kara Theodori. So Kara Theodori can be thought of as a special, uh, special proof or special, uh, uh, yeah, special protocol for coin P. So we say that a class has co VC dimension. K if every non-realizable sample S contains 
a subsample. S prime of size smaller than k that is non realizable. Okay? So, um, Karate Odori basically shows that for a uh, hyper half spaces, we have co VC dimension 2d plus 1. And obviously, having co VC dimension k means that the class is in co and p. Um, and what we show is that it's actually equivalent. So this is the only type of proof that you can expect. So let me write exactly what we can show on the decision problem. Um. following our equivalent so one age is in P two age is in NP and in co P Realize that age has finite VC dimension and finite co VC dimension. And four, there exists. The protocol for the decision problem with um, sample complexity, sample complexity. Oh, so exactly the sample complexity that we had in the algorithm. So it's d k square log m. Okay. H should be thought of as a, as a familiar function on some infinite domain because otherwise. Uh, yeah. If yeah, exactly. If it's not in a infinite domain. So okay. So I'll also remark here that this relation uh, here we show. Between these two, what we know is that VC implies NP, sorry, NP implies VC, it's finite VC. And co NP is equal to, to co VC. Okay, so co VC characterizes co NP completely and uh, being a class in NP implies that you have finite VC dimension, and we don't know if classes with finite VC dimension always are in NP. You have a polylog in your definitions here, and the theorem has a, this a log M? Yeah, exactly. So if you can do it in polylog, you can do it in log M. So, so the, the proof from the here to here is basically, sorry, because from. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you Um Okay, so maybe uh, last remark I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about uh, non-uniform models, because maybe a different, like you can think of a different model that instead of looking at infinite classes, maybe just look at discretization of the, of the classes. Um, so 
so I'll give a theorem that we show. Oh, and one more thing that I have not discussed is uh, how is this related to proper learning? So I just said you can solve the question whether there is an hypothesis. Um, roughly, it's, it's equivalent, unless you make weird assumption on your hypothesis class, like a very large cardinality or something like that, then they are equivalent. Yeah, it's countable or closed or anything not weird. Okay, so this is another theorem we have, which is uh, for hypothesis class H. The following are equivalent. Equivalent. No, H is still not finite, but uh, here here will be the point. So H is in P, and for every finite uh, there is a protocol, it's also true for the promise problem, but I'll show it uh, for the realizability problem, decision problem. Uh, yeah, for age restricted to R with uh, some bit complexity. There is a protocol uh, in Yao's model. I should have added in Yao's model. So now we are finite, so I don't even need to send examples. I can send bits because every, bi every example can be uh, written as a log R bits. And so now I'll add even more power. I'll allow you to send whatever you want in Yao's model with bit complexity. C times log M R and C and M depends only on H. So roughly if for every uh, if there is a for every finite discretization of the class uh, there is uh, an efficient protocol, and it doesn't scale with the size of the discretization, and then basically you can look at protocols and just send examples. This M is not the sample size. No. No. Uh, so now the, so the sample size is now uh, bounded by R, by the size of R. So what is M again? M is some constant. So, C, uh, so M and C are constants, and they depend only on the hypothesis class. They do not depend on the... So in some sense, it means that, okay, we restricted our attention to protocols that send examples. If you are interested in protocols that send bits, it might seem restrictive, and you might think uh, maybe I lose some power, and maybe it's not everything, but actually everything you can do, you can do. At least if you look at efficiency, right? You can probably do, maybe you can do better. But if you care only on efficiency and logarithmic dependence, then looking at protocols that send examples is uh, sufficient. And a similar result would also hold for the promise problems. So also, improper learning in this model and in this model are actually equivalent. It's a kind of compactness thing. If you could you like if you prefer Yao's model and work with this, then you oh. can solve every finite problem, then you can also solve. Yeah, so the proof would actually be that if you can do that, then the there is a finite VC dimension. If there is a shattered set, then you would not be able to even in Yao's model solve this. B basically, the reduction is what we saw. You just do set this joint. If there is a shutter set, then deciding that uh, a sample is realizable means basically to decide that we didn't see uh, the same point twice with different labeling. So it's a set this joint problem. And also, COVID dimension finite. So, so this notion actually helps you to show these kind of equivalences. <coughs> 